Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy today to talk with Dr. Kent Berridge. He is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of Michigan. And we are going to talk about reward, motivation, drive, pleasure, addiction, wanting, liking, emotion, consciousness. And I think it's going to be a wonderful uh, interview. Welcome, Kent. How are you doing today? Great, Bruno. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to join you. Perfect. Thank you. So I would like to talk about the dopamine circuit because we're talking about those circuitry that are controlled by uh, a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And it's a very, very old neurotransmitter that you can find in bacteria and some plants. So Kent, how old is a dopamine uh, neurotransmitter? Well, it's an ancient molecule, as you say, it's in both animals and plants. And for that to be the case, if it's descended from a common ancestor, it would have to go back billions of years, anywhere from one to two to three billion years to find a common ancestor that would give rise to mammals and plants. Alternatively, it could have resulted in separate paths, you know, separately, independently in plants and animals through convergent evolution, operating on each of them, kind of pushing it. Um, I don't think we know the answer to that, but I probably would, plan A would be that it's it's a homologous molecule descended from well, the common ancestors. It means it would have appeared before the beginning of the central nervous system, which is about maybe five, 600 million years old. So we'd have a function before any anything to do with the nervous system. Absolutely. It's a signaling molecule. I think that's the way to think of it. And there's a number of ancient signaling molecules that are used in a many different ways, even within us, used still in many different ways. So as you email to me, you know, dopamine is present in our kidneys and in our gut and in the heart. And it does signaling things in each of those things. In the kidney, oh, yeah. it helps to promote sodium excretion and water excretion to some extent. Um, in the heart, it alters reactivity and activity of the heart and vasodilation as a constriction um, of the heart. And in the gut, it's sort of modulating digestive functions. All of that is separate from what it does in the brain. So basically, it can be used as a signal. And in those local places, it's secreted by a cell right next to the cells trying to signal to. So it's local paracrine signals. That's why it's so complicated to understand. It has numerous functions yeah. in the body. So um, in plants, I mean, I know that uh, there's two things I know about plants. I know it's, there's a lot of it in bananas. It's a plant with the most dopamine. And I know it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So if you really want to have dopamine, you better eat fava beans because you have L-dopa, which is a precursor, and this one's going to be absorbed and, and you can use it. I, I, I have heard even improve uh, motor function in Parkinson's disease to eat fava beans, even especially the, the beans and even the, the pod outside. But so we have a signal mo molecule, which has nothing to do with central nervous system movement in plants. Yes, and I don't actually know what it's signaling in plants. I'm sure a botanist could tell us. Um, but it, what, I think what evolution has done is it's created a number of molecules that can be used as signals. And once it has that, you can use it in all kinds of systems for the signal you wish to transmit within that system. So do you have like an, a letter of the alphabet in a sense? Right. But do you have an overall theme for dopamine? Because I am quite confused in animal. It can reduce locomotion, increase uh, food exploratory uh, movements. Uh, I know in some animal it inhibits swimming, promote crawling. So I'm yes. really like, it's so that it brings us to the brain, and in the brain, of course, it is a neurotransmitter being made by particular neurons and then released by them onto other neurons. And what it does in the brain is going to depend on which system is part of. There's there's a massive system in the brain that's most famous for dopamine. It's the nigrostriatal system, the mesostriatal system from the midbrain to striatal targets. And about half of it is motor function, famous in Parkinson's disease. Um, the substantia nigra dopamine neurons die and the striatum loses its dopamine and causes Parkinson's symptoms. This is sort of the top half of that massive system. And then the bottom half is the ventral half. And that's more the reward motivation system, the limbic system. So let's show that. So you, you said there's about 
going what we call the dorsal striatum, which is um, going with movement that we have in Parkinson, about 50% for reward motivation, the ventral striatum. It's about like that. Those. Yes, something like that. It might be more like 60, 40 or 70, 30. Yeah, more or less. Like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's 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 see that we don't get lost. So we have the midbrain here. You can see my arrow moving, right? You can see the yes. uh, midbrain or, or mesencephalon in green, one of the three parts of the brain stem. And if you have an horizontal cut, so you have the front here with the tegmentum, the back with the tectum, and you have the central canal of the spinal cord right here. It's more detail, the central canal, periaqueductal gray matter here for pain, the cranial nerve three, and in between here, we are what we call the ventral tegmental area that has to do with, um, which is the, one of the circuitry for dopamine here. And you have a, the main one we're talking about for movement here, the uh, substantia nigra, nigra compacta reticulata, right here. And in the back of this area, just a little bit here, you're going to have the raffae. So you're going to have a little bit of serotonin uh, in this area. Serotonin in the back. Here we have dopamine and mainly here for movement dopamine. And if we continue, we have this ventral tegmental area in the midbrain. And another very important center, the nucleus accumbens here, both center for Dopamine, so VTA, ventral tegmental area in blue. And if we continue a little bit, we talked about, we are talking about this circuit. So one of the uh, main circuit in red is nigro from the substantia nigra striatal to the dorsal striatum, so caudate nucleus. And that would be the Parkinson's red. disease relevant pet system. So that's in red. So if we uh, don't, if we don't have enough dopamine, to go to uh, stimulate the dorsal striatum, so putamen, caudate nucleus, we have movement problem, rigidity, all the problem of Parkinson. And then you have, uh, you said about 50, 60% is here. Then we have two plus three more very rare circuitry, but we have at least two, the mesolimbic in green and the mesocortical in orange. Those are the ventral striatum, that has to do with reward, motivation, drive, addiction. And this very beautiful area, nucleus accumbens, crossed by these um, two circuitry in orange and in green, is going through the nucleus accumbens here, which is between the putamen and the caudate nucleus. This is horizontal cut, and we have this nucleus accumbens right here. So now we have... Again, three main circuits. There's more, but those are the three most famous: nigro or meso striatal, and you have meso limbic in green, and meso cortical going to the cortex in orange. So we see two parts: the motor part that we know pretty well, and we're going to talk today more about the green and orange circuit, right? More reward addictions and things like this. So we can stay, keep that little image here for a while. So this is the dopamine secreted in the brain. Now, do you know how many, how much is secreted in the brain versus in the gut and the kidney, or most of it in the, in the human body is secreted in the brain? Well, I think the gut may actually have more dopamine than the brain, um, but it's, and, and in the brain, you know, it's, it's concentrated within these particular systems you've shown us. But there, it's very, very important for the psychological and movement functions uh, of the brain. So you would completely separate action in the brain and the action in the rest of the body. The action in the, yes. the pancreas, the immune system is completely... We may talk about that later. Let's come back. So we're in the brain now, and you have... And this dopamine doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So it is action in the central nervous system mainly for, for the dopamine secret in, in the brain. You define... This molecule are the molecule that create the want. We want something more than we like something, correct? That's what I believe now. You know, um, dopamine is famous as a reward neurotransmitter. And for 50 years, it's been famous. And really, at the beginning, it was thought to be the, the pleasure neurotransmitter that was reward because it was the pleasure of reward. It was the liking of the rewards. And when I entered the field a few decades ago, I believed that hypothesis absolutely. There was great 
sophisticated evidence to support the notion that dopamine was pleasure liking. Um, and my first experiments on dopamine were meant to give just a, a, one more little piece of evidence to the enormous pile that dopamine seemed to be pleasure liking. That was the, our original intention years ago. Yeah, I remember there's few experiments that showed really that dopamine is more want than like. Yes. So, you know, the reason people thought dopamine was pleasure liking in the 1980s was really due mostly to the efforts of one neuroscientist named Roy Wise, who was then at Concordia University in Montreal in Canada. And Wise had a, what he called the dopamine pleasure hypothesis based upon what he called the dopamine blockade. What he would do, it, mostly animal studies, he would let rats work for food rewards or drug rewards or sex rewards or brain stimulation electrode rewards. They would work for all of these rewards. And then he would give them a dopamine blocking drug, uh, an antipsychotic neuroleptic drug that blocks dopamine receptors. So dopamine can no longer bind to those receptors. And at moderate doses of these drugs, what he would find is that the animals, they would at first still go to the reward and try to work for it, but then they would gradually abandon that. They would just stop working gradually and they would gradually stop consuming the food or the other rewards while they had these dopamine blocking drugs. And he said, you know what that looks like? It looks like if you had a normal rat who was working for reward and then you suddenly turn the reward off, what they would do is gradually abandon it. And you know they sort of would still work at first, hopefully, but as they weren't getting any reward, they would gradually abandon it. And this is called extinction in a normal rat. When you turn off the reward, you gradually extinguish their effort. Well, the drug, even though the rats were getting these foods and other rewards, the dopamine blocking drug was making them behave as though they as though they were in extinction, gradually abandoning it. So he called this extinction mimicry induced by dopamine blockade. And he said, you know, it makes sense that they would gradually abandon it if they no longer like it, if the drug is blocking their liking for it, just like you had turned off the reward entirely, you're extinguishing the pleasure of the reward. And he and people would come in and criticize him and say, well, you know, um, Roy Wise, you know that the dopamine system is also involved in movement and Parkinson's disease. So maybe your dopamine blockade is just sort of making them tired or unable to keep on working. So maybe they're doing that. And he had clever experiments to show that was not the explanation. So the antipsychotic, even in human, can create anhedonia, extension of pleasure. It's known for yes. that. People get. So you were, so he couldn't just separate pleasure or wanting he, he well it said that's right so anhedonia is the phrase that's applied to antipsychotic use and it's applied to schizophrenia in some forms even before the antipsychotics are taken they said, said to be anhedonic likewise in parkinson's disease if a person is unmedicated and losing their dopamine those parkinson's patients have been reported to be anhedonic also because they kind of just stop caring so much about the reward so if they all look this way on the other hand in the last 10 to 20 years it's become clearer that sometimes these anhedonia labels are not accurate labels, that the patient, the Parkinson's patient, for example, if you give them different flavored ice creams and ask them to rate the pleasure, they'll give absolutely normal pleasure ratings. Um, it's just that the ice cream isn't very important to them and nothing in life is in that. In that so they like it, they don't want they it. They like it, but they, they and, and new terms have been devised. So rather than call it anhedonia, some would call it now avolition, uh, meaning loss of kind of will to, to engage or, or call it anticipatory anhedonia as opposed to real consumatory anhedonia. These are phrases. In a sense, these, this literature agrees now with our view that started about 30 years ago. But in the beginning, nobody else agreed with us that dopamine was more wanting than liking. Whether well, this is either experiment really to show it's like more than more, sure. it's more, more than like, yeah. Well, the first experiment was actually with Roy Wise, a collaboration. He sent a graduate student here to Ann Arbor in Michigan from Concordia, Montreal, from Montreal in Canada to combine and do an experiment in my lab once. That was to give dopamine blocking drugs and to look at pleasure liking in a slightly different way, not the, his usual way where they're working for the rewards or just consuming the rewards, measuring just work and consumption. But rather, we were looking at taste liking, food liking, using a different measure for examining brain mechanisms of pleasure. It's a measure more like the one that human parents have used for thousands of years to ask their newborn baby infants, do you like the taste of foods we eat? By sort of giving them just a little taste yeah. in their mouth and seeing what they do. Do they kind of smile? 
or do they go like that and, and spit it out? Human infants do, you know, to sweetness, they like it and they smile and lick their lips. To bitterness, they would gape and shake their heads and shake their arms. If you gave it to a chimpanzee, you get similar reactions, sweetness versus bitterness. And if you give it to a rat, you also get similar reactions. Of, they don't have quite the same musculature, but they can lick their lips to sweetness and they can gape. We were looking at it in that sort of way to kind of get it right there, the hedonic impact, the immediate pleasure or displeasure, disgust of a taste. And we expected that if we gave dopamine blocking drugs, it would reduce the liking, positive liking reactions that sweetness elicited, maybe abolish them. So they'd be more like it was just water, not sweet, maybe even make it a little disgusting. So maybe they would gape a little. And we gave the dopamine blocking drugs and we gave the rats the sweetness and they gave us absolutely normal liking reactions. It's as though they had no drugs at all. You know, we were expecting loss of pleasure, a little bit of anhedonia, and they were showing us normal pleasurable reactions. We didn't believe that experiment. We basically thought, well, maybe we did something wrong. It was a first experiment trying this together. So I collaborated with another psychopharmacologist who does drug experiments, and we gave other dopamine blocking drugs and other different kinds of drugs, and we found that the dopamine blocking drugs never changed these reactions. At that point, um, I thought, well, maybe the drugs just aren't strong enough. I still believe Roy Wise was probably right about pleasure, dopamine being pleasure. So let's do something stronger. Let's take dopamine away. And you can do that in the diagram you've shown. If you take a little micro injection and in the midst of those fibers where they're going through the base of the brain there, right there, yes, anesthetize the rat. And in the surgery, do a little micro injection of a droplet of a neurotoxin. It's called 6-hydroxydopamine. It's a neurotoxin that it only kills neurons that are containing and releasing dopamine. It will not kill other neurons, but dopamine neurons will be destroyed. And you can see they're all bundled together there. So you can basically destroy the whole entire dopamine system in this one little micro injection. With my colleague, Terry Robinson here at the University of Michigan, who was doing these kinds of lesion studies, we did that and on both sides of the brain. So we basically destroyed 98 to 99% of the dopamine system. We could measure the dopamine in the brain after. So it left only one to 2% of the original dopamine. And these rats were like very severe Parkinson's patients. They never did anything. They just sort of sat there quietly. They could move. If you pinch their tail or something, they'd turn around, they'd bite you. Um, they could take a few steps, but then they'd stop. They would lapse into this apathy. They would never voluntarily eat. They would never voluntarily drink. They would never pursue any reward at all. But we could nourish them. We could feed them and, and give keep them hydrated with water. And then the question was, what if we gave them the sweetness? Would they at least now no longer like it? And the answer was, they liked it perfectly well. Absolutely like normal rats. There was no reduction, let alone abolition of this liking reaction. Absolutely normal. And... We thought, well, let's try some other things. Could they learn new likes and learn dislikes? And the answer was yes, they could learn new likes and new dislikes. They have normal learning about rewards. They had normal reward liking and disliking. If we gave them bitterness, they would show disgust. If we gave them a sweet taste and say, let's let's induce a, a learned aversion to this taste. If we gave that sugar sweet taste to the rats, they would show gapes and as though it were bitter. And even without dopamine, the rats would learn this perfectly well. So they were competent in all kinds of reward learning and liking and disliking ways. They just didn't want anything. And that was the beginning of the notion that, well, maybe dopamine is more about wanting rewards that are liked than it is about the liking, generating the liking for those rewards themselves. The, the liking is more attributed to, uh, to opiates. That's what you think right now. Yes, within particular brain structures, the opiates can induce the liking, absolutely right, and generate positive liking the way dopamine was thought to have done many years ago. So when you give cocaine to someone, you still stimulate the dopamine system. Yes, that's right. Cocaine most directly stimulates the dopamine system specifically. Morphine, morphine does something slightly different. Morphine is an opiate, and it does not directly activate the dopamine neurons. Morphine does release dopamine. It just does it indirectly by acting on a earlier neuron. Right. So in those, in the case of opiates, you have a want and a like at the same time because it does release dopamine. Yes. So opioids they induce intense pleasure and maybe wanting to take more opioids. That's very true. 
Cocaine also induces pleasure and wanting to take more more cocaine. Why does cocaine do it if dopamine is not the pleasure molecule? Maybe that's the question in, in your mind. And there may be two kinds of answers. One is the pleasure of cocaine and, op and opiates can be a little different from each other. Um, cocaine is sort of stimulating and euphoric and it makes the world attractive and people in the world attractive and the world is inviting and you go out. This kind of incentive salience like property that makes the world attractive and engaging, that's very much a dopamine thing. That kind of part of euphoria is a dopamine thing. The intense pleasure of an opiate is not quite that, but there's a secondary consequence of activating cocaine dopamine neurons. And that is, if you look in the nucleus accumbens that's getting the dopamine there in your diagram, mm -hmm. if you looked at those neurons that are getting the dopamine, when they're getting the extra dopamine, if you look really closely, you'll also find that some natural opioid neurotransmitters and kephalins are being released. You have different neurons for pleasure and different pleasure centers that we identify in the brain. So those are activated. That's right. They are separable. They're sort of nestled within each other. The the liking system that generates intense pleasure is sort of nestled within the wanting and they kind of come on together, but you can separate what they're doing through neural manipulations and measuring the concept. So there's no pleasure center in the brain far from any dopamine neuron. They are always intricated together. Well, they, they tend to be all together. That is true. Although there are pleasure generating sites, parts of the hedonic hotspot network in many different places of the brain. There's some up in the cortex in the right sort of a, above the red nucleus of spot, accumbent spot in the what's called this anterior cingulate cortex, another on the side of the brain in the cortex, the insular cortex, and one in the very front of the brain cortex the, in the orbital frontal cortex. So they're separate sites. Now, all of these are getting some dopamine, um, but not as heavy as much as the nucleus accumbens. So it's kind of hard to separate. Now, with aging, we're going to lower secretion of dopamine. So yes, we do. That's right. As, as we go on through life in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, we're losing dopamine neurons. All of us are. And of course, in the Parkinson's disease, we're losing most of the dopamine neurons. What, what makes dopamine neurons so vulnerable in both aging and perhaps the Parkinson's disease is most neurons in the brain, they're connected to other neurons. So they're making synapses. And the average neuron in the brain makes about a thousand synapses to other neurons. But a dopamine neuron in the brain going up to the nucleus accumbens or striatum, it makes a million synapses. It has a million little axon branches that are making connections with other neurons. This is an enormous branching tree of axons. That's very demanding on a neuron to maintain. The, me the metabolic demands of growing this and maintaining it are intense. And it kind of makes dopamine neurons vulnerable to being a little bit disrupted and then to die because of being a celluloid a little disrupted. In natural life, as we go on, we're, this is happening. Our vulnerable neurons are, are going. But most of us will never develop Parkinson's disease um, because we will die of something else before we've lost enough neuron dopamine neurons. To but do we experience less wanting and less pleasure, less liking with age? Well, it is possible that we are experiencing less intense wants. Um, you know, it's kind of commonplace in addiction treatments and discussion of addiction, that many people who develop addictions to drugs of abuse in their late teens, or early 20s, they stay heavy users and addicted through their 20s. But a lot of them, by the time they reach, say, age 39 or 40, have given it up. By the time they're in their mid 40s, most of them have given it up. Now, there's some who aren't, haven't given it up and became, you know, remain compulsively addicted in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on. But most do. Is it possible that sort of a gradual pruning of the dopamine system is helping people to give things up as they go on to life? That's a hypothesis. It's a plausible hypothesis. So we saw about dopamine for motivation, reward, drive, the opiates and opioids for um, pleasure. So serotonin, in my mind, is something like, well, this feels good. I don't need it anymore. It's more relaxed feeling of happiness, contentment. How do you compare serotonin? Yes, I, th I think that's a fair characterization. I mean, the thing about serotonin is that it's subtle in its effects. Dopamine, we can kind of pin these massive effects on, you know, and most drugs of abuse do activate dopamine neurons directly or indirectly. That's what's really turning on those wants for those rewards. Serotonin is very subtle in its actions. 
So for example, there's no drug that turns on serotonin that is addictively compulsively pursued and taken. It doesn't promote addiction. And that's why a lot of medications like antidepressants can target serotonin and promote serotonin. Nobody's worried that the yeah. person's going to compulsively get addicted. What does serotonin do? You know, there's a few things that seem clear. So some forms of, imp of sort of over impulsiveness and anxiety are linked to deficits in serotonin that can occur naturally in both animals and in humans. Um, so sort of impulsiveness, over impulsiveness um, in multiple domains, maybe a deficit and kind of having more serotonin, as you say, is a little bit of contentment. It makes us a little bit less likely to grab that Im next impulse, whether it's good or bad. And the effects of antidepressant drugs may also kind of give this sort of slight detachment and relaxation. To say what serotonin is actually doing, you know, in a strong sense, it's very, very difficult to put a single label on. Right, right. It's, so, it's probably one of our least understood neurotransmitters, even though it's manipulated with antidepressant. When we talk about addiction, do we have a physiological um, dysfunction in the dopamine system is that you feel is there's a lot of physical or more an emotional problem uh, with addiction or both? Well, I, th I think it's both. Um, it is an emotional situation, but it is also a physical brain situation. Um, there are brain theories of addiction, several of them. Um, you know, originally people thought, you know, that people that addiction happened because drugs were taken just for the pleasure of it. And then it became clear that a lot of drugs are producing strong withdrawal symptoms. In the 1970s and 80s, the main addiction theories, and 90s even, were sort of focused on withdrawal. Uh, if, you, if you take a drug again and again, every time you take it, it releases dopamine. If you keep on over you know, taking it continuously, you're spritzing these accumbens neurons and stridal neurons with extra dopamine all the time. And they begin to downregulate their, res their receptors for dopamine. They're trying to sort of suppress this overstimulating signal. So you actually lose some of the dopamine receptors. D2 dopamine receptors are most famous for this. Um, people like Nora Volkow at the, at the National Institute of Drug Abuse would give, do pet studies on addicts. And she would find that if she gave them a radioactive drug that would bind to their dopamine receptors, she got less binding in people who were addicted to cocaine or heroin and other than in other people. And what she th what that she thought that meant was that they had lost some of their dopamine receptors, um, so the drug couldn't bind to them anymore. They had lost right. it. Now, what does it mean? What is it? What's it causing if you lose some dopamine receptors? Well, those were the days when the dopamine pleasure hypothesis was in ascendance, and so the interpretation usually was that part of people who had lost their had had downregulation of dopamine receptors had lost pleasure. So the story was maybe they had a reward deficiency, food, social interactions, career rewards. They were not all that pleasant to them in this reward deficiency. Maybe drugs were the only thing that they could find pleasure in, so they're pursuing the drug. There are a couple of more worries about that kind of a theory. Um, one is what if dopamine's not the pleasure mechanism after all, then it doesn't quite make sense that uh, loss of dopamine is gonna reduce the pleasure. The other is, it is true that you can downregulate the dopamine receptors, um, but it's, it's, there's evidence to suggest that that's really more of a consequence of the extra dopamine stimulation than the cause of the addiction. It's really a consequence. And it may be sort of a partial compensation for the overstimulation. The neurons are downregulating in order to reduce this bombardment of the extra s signal that they're getting. And they are reducing it somewhat, but they're not reducing it as much as the extra signal coming through. So they may still be overstimulated, getting a strong dopamine signal. There are other brain theories of addiction that have come, of long, come along. And one of them is actually came from Michigan with my colleague here, Terry Robinson, it's the incentive sensitization. And it suggests that, well, dopamine is really mediating more the wanting than the liking. And it turns out that if you take drugs of abuse again and again, there's two things that actually happen. One is this downregulation of receptors that produces tolerance to the drug. So you can take a bigger dose and get a not as a strong an effect because you're losing some receptors for it. And the, the downregulation also contributes to withdrawal if you stop taking the drug because you have few dopamine receptors and you have been getting bombarded, but now you stop taking the drug. All you have is normal, natural dopamine, yet you have fewer receptors. So you've got a reduced signal. 
and that can contribute to withdrawal symptoms. But all of that goes away within weeks or months if you can wait and not take the drug again. Most of the withdrawal symptoms go away on um, the tolerance kind of fades as well. So, so there, all of that is this one thing. But there's a second thing that can also happen in some individuals who are taking drugs that are used in the same neurons, the same dopamine neurons and the neurons that are receiving dopamine. And this is called neural sensitization, mesolimbic sensitization of the dopamine system. And it's it doesn't happen in everyone. Some individuals are vulnerable to this, but others are more resistant. At street doses of addictive drugs, some individuals sensitize. What will happen if they sensitize is the dopamine neurons start to release even more dopamine to the same dose of drug as it did originally. So you're actually, if you're measuring dopamine release in the in the nucleus accumbens, you see the same dose gets a bigger dopamine release. So sensitization, what would this do psychologically? If dopamine is mediating the wanting of things, then someone who's having this sensitized hyperdopamine reaction to drug cues is going to experience a sort of hyper want, excessively strong want that other people who are taking the same drug recreationally, but who aren't sensitized, they, they may want the drug, but this person really wants that drug in a way, it, kind of parallel that maybe all of us can identify with is we all want food when we're hungry. You know, that's something we all share. We want and like food when we're hungry. But what if we were starved for weeks and weeks and weeks and months and really lost weight? Somebody who's in a starvation condition, that person, if food comes into the room, is going to be so attention riveted. That person wants food to a degree that most of us never have that intensity. And if sensitization is doing the same thing to addiction, it may be that an addict has that kind of an intense want like a starving person would have for food. 